The story begins on October 1st, 2001. What's significant about that date? It was Cal Ripken Jr.'s final appearance in Major League Baseball. After 21 seasons playing on the left side of the Baltimore Oriole infield, first as a shortstop, then as a third baseman, the team suddenly had a giant hole to replace in their lineup. During Ripken's final season in the big leagues, the club signed veteran infielder Tony Batista to be a possible replacement for him once the legendary Hall of Famer retired. Batista had a fine season filling in as the everyday third baseman in 2002, playing in 161 games and hitting over 30 home runs, but after a poor 2003 season, the Orioles let him walk in free agency and he signed with the Montreal Expos. While Batista was only a temporary solution for Baltimore's third base needs, he wasn't their first choice. Originally, the plan was to have Ripken be replaced by another Hall of Famer, Scott Rowland. Debuting with the Phillies in 1996, Rowland had spent his entire career in Philadelphia through the 2001 season. However, feuds with Phillies management, notably with skipper Larry Boa, forever strained the relationship the club had with him and Rowland wanted out as soon as possible. He rejected a huge 10-year, $140 million extension following the 2001 season and instead demanded to be traded. Seeing how Philadelphia would not be able to retain him, and 2002 was Rowland's last year as a Philly before he hit free agency, the third baseman was as good as gone. Now, it's important to note that Rowland was one of the best players in Major League Baseball at the time, Undoubtedly, the best overall third baseman not named Chipper Jones. In a five-season stretch from Rowland's rookie year in 1997 through the 2001 campaign, there were 173 players with at least 2,000 plate appearances and Rowland ranks inside the top 40 in OPS and adjusted OPS. Among 19 third basemen, he ranks second in both to only Chipper Jones. A defensive wizard, Roland was also one of the premier defenders in the game, having the 15th highest D-War in this five-season stretch and the third highest among third basemen. Also, consider the fact that, among all players in baseball from 1997 to 2001, not a single one was able to match Roland's D-War and his adjusted OPS. There were some players that came close, but Scott Roland was the only player in that five-year stretch to earn at least 5.9 D-War, with an adjusted OPS of at least 128. Seeing how one of the best players in baseball is on the trade market, it seems like a perfect match for Baltimore. That was the thinking Orioles general manager Sid Thrift had, as he and the Phillies GM, Ed Wade, came to a verbal agreement to send Scott Rowland to Baltimore. It's impossible to determine just how far along the trade was, but we can presume it was closer to being done than not. We can claim that because we know exactly who was going to be involved in the deal. The trade the two sides agreed upon was Scott Rowland, relief pitcher Chris Brock, infielder Chris Jordan, and another prospect in exchange for Sidney Ponson, Buddy Groom, Eric Bedard, Sean Douglas, and Jeff Conine. One source also claims Jay Gibbons was a part of the deal going to Philadelphia, so we're looking at a 9 or 10 player trade. For context purposes, of the other players the Phillies were giving up, Chris Brock was an average at best reliever who made his final MLB appearance in 2002, while Kevin Jordan was a below average player who never made it back to the big leagues after 2001. There's no indication to who that prospect might have been, so I would presume them to be a low tier one in the organization. I'll get back to the Baltimore side of the deal later. This enormous trade would have gone through if not for the Baltimore Orioles owner, Peter Angelos. There is a lot that can be said about Angelos and his impact as an owner, but that's a topic for another time. After both general managers verbally agreed to the trade, Thrift phoned Angelos regarding the deal, and the owner asked how much it would cost to retain Roland. The Orioles were giving up a lot for a player entering free agency, so should the deal go through, it's highly expected an extension would have occurred. When Thrift stated a 10-year, $150 million contract would be what it would take to keep rolling, Angelos put an end to the trade right then and there. To quote Thrift, When I called the owner and told him that, he said forget it. Thanks to Peter Angelos, the high price tag for Scott Rowland caused the Orioles to pivot away from acquiring him, and they settled for Tony Batista at third base. 
I'm sure this must have angered many fans back in the day for several reasons. The Orioles of the 1990s had some of the highest budgets in Major League Baseball and now they're being cheap? Peter Angelos was someone who famously spent big on free agents just a few years prior and now he balked at the idea to lock up the next franchise star? Second, the Orioles were in a slump entering 2002. After playoff appearances in 1996 and 1997, the team failed to have so much as a winning record in the previous four seasons. Their 63-98 record in 2001 was their worst season in over a decade. Naturally, Roland would not have turned around the team himself, but it's a step in the right direction and gives confidence in the organization that you're trying to build a contender. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, Baltimore spent a noteworthy amount of money in the near future anyway. Two years following the failed trade for Scott Rowland, they signed shortstop Miguel Tejada to a six-year, $72 million contract. They would also give out a $22.5 million deal to catcher Javi Lopez, while paying over $10 million to Sammy Sosa when they trade for him following the 2004 season. Additionally, the Orioles would also give Melvin Mora $25 million and Brian Roberts $40 million, but who's counting? It seems puzzling to me that they would dish out all that money to others, but not Scott Rowland. Yes, it was for 10 years, which would keep Baltimore on the hook until he was 37 years old, but then again, Melvin Mora was 34 years old at the time he was extended for three more seasons. At the end of the day, Scott Rowland would end up being traded to the St. Louis Cardinals, won a World Series with them, and dons a Cardinals logo on his Hall of Fame plaque rather than what could have been an Orioles one. By the way, imagine Baltimore going from Cal Ripken Jr. to Scott Rowland to Manny Machado as their third baseman over a 20-year span. To wrap up the video, I'll discuss the entire point I wanted to make. This trade falling through changed baseball history due to who the Orioles did not trade away. Looking at the players Baltimore planned to trade away, most never positively affected them in the long run. Veterans Jeff Conine and Buddy Groom played multiple seasons for the team, but eventually departed in the mid-2000s. Rookie outfielder Jay Gibbons enjoyed several seasons as an Oriole, but eventually got cited in the Mitchell Report and the club released him. Pitching prospect Sean Douglas only managed to pitch in five seasons in the big leagues, having an ERA over six in around 200 innings. He was out of baseball by 2005. Young starting pitcher Sidney Ponson, who Baltimore would eventually sign to a three-year, $22.5 million deal, I might add, struggled with the Orioles following that deal, where he posted an ERA over 5.5 in nearly 350 innings from 2004 to 2005. Oh, and he got released by the club after he was arrested for assault and multiple DUIs. Imagine if that haul went to Philadelphia. However, there was one player that did make a positive impact on the team, and that was Eric Bedard. Bedard, a pitching prospect at the time, would blossom into a fine starter. His best season came in 2007, where he finished 5th in Cy Young voting. In the offseason that year, Baltimore traded him to the Seattle Mariners in a package that brought in four players, including Adam Jones and Chris Tillman. Adam Jones would go on to become one of the greatest players in Orioles history, while Tillman turned into a solid starting pitcher, throwing over 1,100 innings in 10 seasons for Baltimore. Most importantly, both of those two players were key pieces in the Orioles' three playoff appearances from 2012 to 2016. So, for Peter Angelos deciding not to trade for Scott Rowland, it eventually led to the team acquiring two household names, guiding them to the playoffs three times. The Orioles might not have ended up with their franchise third baseman to replace a baseball legend, but they came away with a great deal nevertheless. Sometimes, it's the trades a team doesn't make that change baseball history.